So now I'm going to introduce Teresa Strong. She is FPWR's Director of Research. Um, she's uh, received a BS from Rutgers University and a PhD in Medical Genetics from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. After her postdoc, she returned to the faculty of UAB, where her laboratory focused on developing gene therapy approaches in cancer. Teresa is one of the founding members of FPWR and has directed FPWR's grant program since its inception. In October of 2016, she transitioned to a full-time position as director of research programs at FPWR. She also remains an adjunct professor in the Department of Genetics at UAB. We are so lucky to have Teresa on our team, so please welcome Teresa Strong. Okay, thank you. So, you know, we were talking about the agenda for the meeting and uh, Susan said, you know, we, it would be great if you could give a summary of the, the research symposium. And she said where it would fit is, you know, what is today? Today's Friday. I don't even know what day. Today I'm Friday, you know, at four o'clock. And I was like, okay, sure, that'd be fine. Well, the research symposium just ended at noon today. So. <laughs> I have been trying to put slides together, um, and I will give it a go, but uh, please be patient with me. Um, and please feel free to ask questions. So I'm gonna try to just give you an overview of some of the things that we touched on uh, during the research program. If you have, the uh, abstracts are available. They should be available online. You can download them. They are written for scientists, but if there's things that catch your eye and seem interesting, please come find me or, or anyone on the FPWR research team if you'd like to ha you know, ask some questions about that. I mean, I think it's really uh, important for all of the community to, to you know, learn about science and understand science, that's what our foundation does and you are the heart of our foundation, so please feel free to, to ask us questions. Um, so I'll start by showing my husband who I'm sure nobody could identify because he always stays home with the kids when I come to these meetings. There was one year early on where we brought, he and all the kids came to a conference and it was just, Ever since then, it's been like, okay, you got to stay home with us. <laughs> Love my children. But so that's my husband, Jim. And then uh, my kids, I've got four of them. Uh, the boys are Christopher and Daniel, and they are twins. Um, obviously, they're, they're dizygotic, or they're not, not uh, identical twins. Uh, Christopher doesn't have PWS, Daniel does have PWS. Um, and then I've got Amy uh, and, and Virginia, so that is, that is my crowd. I got a text yesterday from the school, Virginia has strep throat, so I was like, <laughs> texted my husband, <laughs> so. And I uh, also wanted to introduce uh, our FPWR research team. Uh, we have a fantastic group of uh, scientists that are associated with FPWR. We're, we're trying to do a lot of things and uh, we stay busy and we keep things moving and I think we work together really well and it really is a pleasure to work with them every day. So uh, Natalie's gonna uh, come up and tell you a little bit about the Clinical Trial Consortium in a, in a minute, but we've also got Jessica Bahanowicz Jessica, are you way in the back there? Yes. Um, and she is our uh, point person for the Global PWS Registry. So she has uh, helped develop that and is the one who knows the most about how to work that. Um, and, and she'll be giving a talk about all the things that we're doing with uh, the Global PWS Registry to understand the natural history of uh, prader willi syndrome. Uh, we also have Lauren, who, who you all met earlier at the, uh, at the introduction, um, and uh, Lisa Matisvac is, is she in here? She is our, oh, she's, she's, she's working. Uh, she is our PATH study coordinator, so, so many of you, I hope, are enrolled in the PATH for PWS um, study, and she is helping us move that along. Uh, and then our newest uh, uh, member of the FPWR research is uh, Carolyn Vrana Diaz, who, uh, she, I don't know if she's in here or she's outside working as well. So you may have met her when, she, when you were registering. And um, she's a freshly minted PhD, um, and we're really excited to have her join our team. So uh, 
want to talk a little bit about all of the things that we've done in the last few days here in New Orleans. Um, and that started with um, some pre-conference activities, including the uh, meeting of the PWS Clinical Trial Consortium, as well as a genetic therapy workshop. So Natalie uh, Kayajanian is the uh, Director of Translational Research for FPWR, and she is also the Executive Director of the PWS Clinical Trial Consortium. So I will let her tell you a little bit about uh, some of the things that was discussed in this uh, consortium meeting. Thank you, Theresa. It's good to be here today, so I welcome to everyone. So I just would like to, to discuss a few minutes about uh, the PWS, the International PWS Clinical Trial Consortium. So this was launched in 2015, so four years ago. So with the increasing number of clinical trials, which is great for the community because it, it increased the hope that uh, therapeutic is soon going to be available for all of you, uh, but there are also a number of challenges. And we thought that the best way to address these challenges is to gather uh, an international group uh, composed of multiple stakeholders who have the expertise and, and different perspectives on clinical trials to really address clinical trial challenges. So this consortium is made, we have about 30 members. We have stakeholders from industry, all the industry that are conducting clinical trials today are part of the consortium. We have also a number of patient, uh, uh, patient research organizations uh, such as PWSA USA, uh, we have also the International prado willi Syndrome Organization as well as uh, PWS France. And we have also a number of uh, academic and cl uh, clinicians who you, you, you know very well and all the names are, um, it will be too long to, to cite all of them. So it's really a great uh, group of experts. And so what are we doing there? So the, really the mission is to address clinical trials through this international uh, pre-competitive and collaborative uh, platform. And right now we are really focusing our activities around two main areas. One is to support or develop new clinical trial endpoints. So what is a clinical trial endpoint? If you want to assess treatment benefit in a clinical trial, you need to have a measure. This is called an outcome measure or clinical trial endpoints. So you can imagine, for example, for hyperphagia in previous clinical trials, one way to do this is to look at decrease of weight, because hyperphagia leads often to obesity, and one way, a proxy measure of hyperphagia is to see if the drug is efficacious, you would measure a decrease of weight. But as you know, uh, our population is under control environment. Hyperphagia is not always uh, accompanied by obesity. So we need to find really good measures, and you might have heard about HQCT, the hyperphagia questionnaire, which is a caregiver burden administered questionnaire to really assess hyperphagia. And this is what is currently used in clinical trials right now, uh, well validated and accepted by the FDA to really assess treatment efficacy uh, for hyperphagia. But we have also a number of companies who are developing therapeutics for other behavioral challenges. So we are really working uh, uh, within the consortium trying to find some really good outcome measures that would serve as clinical trial endpoints. So that's one major activity of the consortium. The other activity uh, as well of the consortium is really to use a structured method to really assess what is the patient and the caregiver preference in terms of treatment options, in terms of uh, benefit risk assessment. So the regulatory agencies is really interested more and more in trying to understand what is the perspective of the caregivers as well as the patients, not just the clinician, not the other experts. So we are really developing also a number of studies and you might have participated to some of the studies and I would like to thank you for that because it's really advanced our work about how we can better understand you know, what is important for you in terms of, of treatment. Uh, we are also uh, collaborating with Elizabeth Dyken's group to better understand what is the perspective of patients themselves. 
because you know the, the perspective might be a little bit different from the caregivers and it might be different also from the clinicians. And although this population is challenging in terms of you know, intellectual uh, ability, the capacity of reflect on, on, on internal state, it's really important that we, you know, we are trying to really gather data on to better know what is their, their perspective. So in the last four years, we have been developing a number of tools that we thought would be really uh, useful to support clinical trials. One of which is we have developed a video uh, mainly targeting uh, regulatory agencies such as the FDA, but also healthcare providers, investors in clinical trials to better illustrate what is PWS. It's not always easy to, to explain what PWS is, so we thought the best way to do that is to develop a video. So we have a 20 minute and a five minute version that are available on our uh, website um, that really explain the challenges, the specificities across lifespan. Uh, we have also, uh, last year we published, uh, the consortium published two different studies. One is to assess caregiver burden in PWS. It's really important also to gather data about, you know, that we, you know, there's, a, that, we, we, you all know that you know the burden is high in PWS, but it's important also to to really assess that and to compare this to other to other type of diseases. And in fact, in that study, we showed that the caregiver burden is much higher in PWS than for carers of Alzheimer's uh, patients, for example. So these are important data, and I will I will tell you also why a little bit later. We have also collaborated with John Bridges at Ohio State University, who has used really stated preference methods that are well accepted by regulatory agencies to better understand what are the treatment priorities for caregivers. Um, he, is also, uh, he has conducted also a, a, a study on trying to better understand what are the level of risks caregivers are willing to take vis-a-vis -vis treatment uh, benefits in clinical trials. Uh, I just talked about, you know, better understanding also what are the patient preferences. And last year, uh, we were granted a critical path innovation meeting uh, by the FDA. So we met with the FDA. We were a group of about 30 people, and we met with the FDA to discuss about the activities of the consortium, but also to get the input of the FDA about, you know, what we are doing, what is the strategy that we are using, and really pushing also PWS at the forefront and educate the, the FDA about, you know, what is PWS. That's very important. But there's one thing that I would like also to mention. The activities of the consortium is really focused on clinical trial challenges, but it doesn't stop there. And we, had a, we have an annual meeting, and uh, last Wednesday, in particular, we talk about what can the consortium do to support what is called post-marketing studies. So once, hopefully soon, a drug is being approved, so it's called uh, uh, granted a market authorization by the FDA, you know, there's still a long path between, uh, you know, acceptance by the FDA and then uh, uh, access by all the patients and all of you of the drug. Uh, as you know from other diseases, and I don't know if you've heard about you know, that, but for example, the recent uh, event is about spinal muscular atrophy. There are some you know, gene therapy and other pharmacotherapies that, are, you know, that have been shown to be efficacious in clinical trials that have been approved by the FDA for all ages, but the insurance companies, for example, will restrict to a certain age range. So there's a problem here for not now every patient has access to these therapies. So we want to learn from that and make sure that when a drug is, uh, has been granted market authorization, that it will be accessible for the patient. So we are also working on a number of studies uh, about that. And for example, you know, maybe you have participated to the caregiver burden study. We launched another study, I think it was last year. These are really important data also to really show also insurance company that, uh, you know, we, we, we make the assumption that if a drug is beneficial for the patients, it might alleviate also the caregiver burden. But by showing that, you know, this could be the case, we will gather you know, some very useful data that can be used in this post-marketing period when discussion you know, with uh, insurance companies uh, and other stakeholders will take place. Thank you.
and I will say that I, you know, I was at the FDA last month uh, for the launch of a rare disease accelerator cures accelerator, that's a data and analysis platform. And there were many FDA uh, 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 staff there and there was really a lot of discussion about the importance and the work that some of these consortiums, including our consortium, are doing uh, kind of with all the industry partners working with the scientists and clinicians and the patient groups uh, to, to advance all of these kinds of objectives as Natalie has said. So uh, mm -hmm. lots of great work there. Um, the other pre-meeting activity was the uh, PWS Genetic Therapy Workshop. Um, so uh, I, I'm not going to belabor this because we just had a fireside chat about it, and I don't want to be too redundant with that, but just basically um, this was to uh, bring together a group of experts and uh, talk about some of the challenges and the promise of genetic therapy for PWS. So we know that um, all genetic subtypes of PWS actually have the genes in the region sitting there but silenced. And so the question is, you know, can we turn those genes on? Can we replace those genes? Um, and uh, what are the challenges that might accompany that? What are the studies that we have to do to see if that's feasible? Um, and how can we, the foundation, uh, be uh, helping to advance those in the most efficient manner uh, possible? Um, so there have been, and FPWR has funded several studies that have begun to show proof of concept using different approaches uh, for genetic therapy of PWS in, a, in neurons in a dish from uh, Dr. Stormy Chamberlain's lab, for example, and in a mouse model. Uh, those of you who have been around a little while might remember the puzzle project that we did a few years back um, to fund uh, Dr. Yonghui Zhang, um, to sh and he used a small molecule to turn the genes on in a mouse model and showed a beneficial effect. Um, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. So we thought that we would bring all the, the experts together and get their help in defining um, some of the issues around that. Um, so uh, we, we did that on uh, Wednesday afternoon and we asked the, uh, those experts what additional information do they think that we need to know about the region to uh, more efficiently advance genetic therapy for PWS. Um, what, what are the best approaches that we can take? Um, you know, there was a lot of enthusiasm for some of the approaches that have already shown some promise, and how can we move those forward? But what are additional kind of screening approaches that we can use to identify new ways to uh, do genetic therapy for PWS? Uh, one thing that we as the foundation can really do um, is, is provide resources that many scientists can use. So we don't have money to fund every scientist with every good idea, but sometimes if we can help fund a cell line that everybody can use, it's a very relatively small investment of money that benefits uh, many uh, and helps push the entire field forward. Um, and so, uh, so that group met. We are formulating a, a, a group of recommendations, uh, probably a paper to put out into the, to the scientific community to describe the current state and the challenges and the, the, the potential moving forward. And it was a great group, and we were uh, we were really um, thrilled to to have their engagement and have all of them together. So uh, that was a, that was a good time. Okay, so, so now I'm just gonna highlight uh, some of the aspects of the, the research symposium. Um, it was a day and a half event, so it started yesterday, uh, and it was an all day uh, oral presentations. In the evening we had poster presentations, and then we had a half day of additional presentations this morning. I know some of you were uh, present for some of that. In total we had 26 oral presentations and about 20 poster presentations, about 150 attendees that included university university scientists, industry scientists, industry representatives, and, and, and many family members as well. Um, we also, it was an inter, a bit of an international meeting, so we had uh, several individuals come all the way from Australia, which I was very 
happy to have them tell me how much they enjoyed the meeting because I feel like if you're going to travel 24 hours to come to a meeting, it should be worth your while. So they said it was definitely worth their while, which was great to hear because that is, um, the, these scientists are very dedicated and that was one of my big takeaways uh, from this, this meeting that they would come, you know, on the 24 hour trip to meet with the other scientists and, and learn about PWS uh, from others. So we had representatives from uh, US, Canada, Australia, Israel, uh, Chile and Spain. So so uh, a, an excellent group. Um, and I, I was meant to get a picture to insert, but the, there are pictures, so, so you'll be able to see. The other really nice thing I think about this year and as we've grown that has become uh, a, a more of a feature of our scientific meetings is the, the bright young people who are, who are attending. So this year we offered some um, travel awards to, uh, to trainees, so graduate students and postdocs and fellows. And um, several of the, we had several people apply for that and, and, and um, get travel awards. And they did the presenting themselves and they were really, they're so poised and they're so smart, and I don't ever remember being that poised and smart when I was that age, but they are. So uh, that was really great to see, and it's great to see that, uh, you know, the, the these are the people who are going to be the scientists coming down the line. And so if we can hook them early and get them interested in PWS and have them be successful in PWS research, they may stay in PWS research. So we're really excited about that. My big takeaways is I, I thought the presentations were really outstanding. We are so fortunate to have such amazing scientists working on PWS. And I think because it is such a complicated question, there's a certain phenotype, I would say, of scientists who is attracted to it and who really likes to dig into the hard problems. Um, and so, uh, so we're really fortunate in that respect. As I said, many smart young trainees, which is, uh, it's great to see that ratio uh, go up um, and, and more of those individuals come. Uh, there was a really a broad array of topics, which I find very interesting and, and others have commented as well. So there's a lot of molecular biology, a lot of molecular genetics, very hardcore, but there's also some really interesting uh, um, physiology and clinical care and even, you know, uh, sort of social aspects of PWS. Um, and I think it was really great to see the interaction of the different basic scientists with industry partners with each other. There's a lot of collaborations that have started actually at FPWR meetings in years past um, that are, are really yielding some fruit. So Dr. Uh, Stormy Chamberlain, who is doing the um, the uh, fireside chat uh, right before this, she is collaborating with another researcher that we funded at FPWR. We've given them each uh, what is, I mean, to us a lot of money, but but in the big picture is is relatively small amounts of money. She's had a hundred thousand dollar grant. He's had about a sixty thousand dollar grant. With all of that work that they've been doing together, they've applied for an NIH grant together and, and, and just received word that they've gotten that. Now, I don't know the exact amount of those, but NIH grants tend to be on the order of two, two to $300,000 a year for four to five years. So that's a pretty good return on investment, right? We've put 150000 into it, and you know, it's, now they have a million dollar grant to kind of build on that. So we love to see things like that, and I heard other uh, investigators who were we're getting ready to put their NIH grant in, so uh, a lot of good uh, collaborations going. So people who know me know that <laughs> if I give a talk, I'm going to show the, the, the PWS region. Uh, you know, no matter what, you all are going to go away knowing what the genes in the region are. So um, this is to tell you that, uh, you know, this is a very complex region of, of, uh, of genetics that is involved in PWS. And uh, that's kind of the good news and the bad news. Ooh, it's interesting, uh, but it makes it really a challenge. Um, so there are a number of genes. Uh, See if I can get this. Yeah, there there are a number of uh, genes uh, that are expressed normally from dad's chromosome, and they make proteins that do things in the cell. Um, and then there's these funny. You'll hear people talk about the SNORD 116 or the SNOW RNAs. These are are very unusual runs of RNA, and it's not really clear what they're doing, but they're unusual in the genome, and so that's why it's, uh, it, it, it can be such a challenge to understand. Um, so this is the region that everyone is interested in, and so some of the studies that um, people were talking, people presented, were really looking at the basic science. We still don't understand 
what all of these genes do and why when you lose expression of them, you end up with PWS. So a lot of the research is, is aimed at these basic science questions and it's not merely an academic uh, exercise. I mean, everybody loves knowledge, it's good to know knowledge, but, but the other thing that this does, if you understand that, you may be able to figure out a drug kind of downstream that may help PWS. So there's some really practical reasons that uh, our foundation supports this kind of uh, basic science work. Um, so some of the questions that these researchers are asking is what are the normal function of these genes? If we understand what they normally do, we might have a better idea of what happens when they go away. Um, and what happens to a cell? How is a cell, a PWS cell, different than a normal cell? And how can, if we understand that difference, then maybe we could look at drugs that kind of shift it back towards uh, behaving more like a typical cell. Um, so just to get down in the weeds a little bit more, I'll just mention two of the genes, the SNORD116. We know that this is a really important part of uh, everybody who has PWS is missing these SNORD116, even unusual patients who have a very small deletion. And the other gene that is, uh, you know, really, well, they're all important, but another gene that's really important in the region is the MADGEL2 gene. This is lost in almost all individuals with PWS. It's also mutated in the related disorder, Shafyang syndrome, that you you may have heard of. Um, so a, a couple of the investigators, Dr. LaSalle and Stefan Stam, were looking at uh, what is the normal function of the SNORD116 gene. Um, Dr. LaSalle has found that um, the, these genes are really important in, in circadian rhythms. So it is not going to come to a surprise to anyone in this, in this room that our kids are a little off when it comes to that normal sleep-wake cycle. And so her studies are showing that the SNORD116 is actually regulates, it makes this funky RNA cloud that sits on the chromosome and that cloud gets bigger and smaller through the 24-hour cycle. So um, it's just a hint at, at, at what it may be regulating, but it's regulating a lot of the genes that are important in that circadian rhythm. Um, Dr. Stam was looking at how, how SNORD116 affects all these other RNAs and their stability within the cell. Um, and he uses very complex techniques, which I actually followed this time, um, which I was impressed with because he <laughs> can be a challenge to follow. Um, but I will mention, uh, he is using, many of you have uh, donated teeth. Uh, to Dr. Larry Ryder's lab. If you haven't, please talk to me about it. Um, so Dr. Ryder now has a panel of about, I think, 25 to 30 cell lines that are derived from parents who have, when their kid's teeth fall out, you just put it in a tube and ship it off to him. And he's sharing it with many other researchers who are now doing all kinds of research on that. So you'll see a couple of the slides have a tooth on it. That means that those cells were, were used in that study. So thank you to all who have donated. It's so important. And uh, again, uh, if your kid is of that age or if your child is getting, a, or your older child is getting wisdom teeth out, you can also uh, donate the wisdom teeth. You have to have the kit ahead of time, though, so you have to uh, go to the website and get the kit. Um, the other gene of importance that, or that was talked about quite a bit is MADGEL2 uh, again, and uh, this, this gene does encode a protein, and there was a, a couple of uh, studies from Dr. Weverick uh, looking at uh, what other proteins MADGEL2 is interacting with to start to understand that. Um, and then uh, uh, Dr. Uh, or Helen Chen, um, who's with Ryan Potts at St. Jude, was looking at when you lose MADGEL2, um, the, the proteins, other proteins in the cell don't, don't recycle the way they're supposed to. So proteins go out to the cell membrane and then they come back in and they go back out and that gets disrupted uh, in PWS and also in Shafyang. And that's important because that phenotype, that characteristic of not recycling those proteins is now something maybe you can take that, you know, uh, do a screen. So take thousands of drugs and see if we can kind of correct that defect. So defining these Phenotypes is really important towards the next step of finding treatments. Um, and then the basic question of how is a PWS cell different than a typical cell was addressed in a couple of ways by uh, researchers at University of Connecticut um, using uh, cells developed by Dr. Chamberlain um, to look at the RNA differences between those cells. 
Um, Dr. Ryder's group is looking at the different genetic subtypes of PWS and looking at the differences between UPD and deletion. We know that kids with UPD, uh, so, so everyone's at risk for autism symptoms in PWS, but the kids with UPD tend to be at a slightly higher risk, so why is that? And so she's really looking at those with autism symptoms, those without autism symptoms, uh, and plus minus deletion or UPD and looking for those comparisons. So getting at the root causes of those differences. We also spent a lot, uh, there were several presentations looking uh, at uh, technologies and strategies for genetic therapy for PWS. Uh, so uh, Stormy Chamberlain's lab. Um, we had a new investigator who um, is uh, from UC uh, San Francisco who's looking at a CRISPR-based approach. They've applied that to a different genetic disorder, SIM1 deficiency, which is also associated with obesity, but very different than PWS in other ways. Um, so it was great to have her here. She's just learning about PWS. She's an expert in this kind of technology, so we hope that she'll now be inspired to take her technology and apply it to PWS. Um, and then uh, Marnie uh, Blewett from Australia, she was one of the brave souls who traveled all the way from Australia to come to this meeting. Um, she is developing a novel gene therapy or gene activation method that's really focused on these uh, upstream genes. She has, dis she, she, for a long time, she's been studying this particular, this particular protein, which it turns out is really important in turning the MAGEL2 nectin group of genes on and off and on and off. So she's kind of been brought into the field because she was first studying one of the genes that regulates this area, and now she is looking to apply that to, to therapies for PWS. We also had some studies um, that were really focused on caring for individuals with PWS. Um, so Diane Stafford, with funding from Melendo Therapeutics, has looked at a database. There's, you know, all of your data is sold, right? So it's sold to this huge database um, that has all of the claims data in the United States. And uh, you can mine that data for individuals with PWS. You can identify those and then ask, you know, why are they going to the doctor? Why are they in the hospital? So they mined uh, one of the large uh, existing data uh, databases and found 9,000 patients with PWS, about 9,000 in the U.S., and then looked at you know, some, some just diabetes, cardiovascular diseases, mortality rates um, in those 9,000 individuals. Um, and so it, they found, not surprisingly, that there was an increase, there, there was an increased incidence of diabetes starting early, um, in early at younger ages. Uh, presumably that's associated with individuals who have poorly controlled obesity in PWS. Um, there is increased mortality across the lifespan, so there's about a three-fold risk compared to uh, the general population of, of, of uh, having a, a death at any time uh, across the lifespan. Um, so that's really Im important information for understanding in the entire PWS population what things are popping up. Um, we also had a presentation by Dr. McTee from uh, the Children's Institute of Pittsburgh, which um, many of you may be familiar with. They used to have an inpatient program. They're now moving to a, an outpatient-based program, and they're interested in members of the PWS community knowing about that and reaching out if they want to do it. So you, you, you and your, rather than your child going to Pittsburgh and being admitted, you stay home and you work with the team uh, from Children's uh, Institute to address whatever challenges you're having in the home setting. Um, there was another presentation about the underlying basis of osteoporosis in PWS. So this is not something, you know, that tends to be highest on the list of, um, you know, problems in PWS, but, um, you know, it's a, it actually is a really important problem because People with PWS have fractures and breaks much more often than the general population. We're starting to see this in the Path for PWS study. And if you have, you know, broken bones, then you're not exercising. And so, you know, it's really sort of a, a, a bad uh, loop that you can get into. Um, so there's a study that looked at the underlying basis of that and now has a potential therapeutic um, that is uh, potentially going to uh, be advanced in, in PWS. 
Um, and then there was a, a, another traveler from Australia, uh, David Godler, um, who has been funded by initially by us and now by us along with Angelman Syndrome Foundation and the Dupe 15 Alliance uh, to develop a newborn screen for PWS. So we know that more children are being diagnosed in infancy with PWS, but we, we know that kids slip through the cracks quite a bit still. And so if there was a newborn screen, that heel stick that they do on new babies and every Everybody got screened. It would give us a hard number about how many individuals with PWS, you know, are born each year. It would get everybody an early diagnosis. Presumably, they could get on growth hormone and the benefits from that very early on. So, in order to do a newborn screening, though, as you can imagine, it can't be an expensive test. So, the the diagnostic tests that we all, our kids, were diagnosed with probably cost hundreds or thousands of dollars, and you can't do that on every newborn. So, the the trick is to be able to do it high throughput and do it. For, for not very much money. So Dr. Gondler has developed uh, a test using that blood spot, um, and it, he can test for six different disorders at once, and it costs about $4 a test. So now you're getting into the sort of the economic argument that you can make the argument to the government that they need to start screening. So he has looked at about 30,000 individuals in Australia, and they, he's finding a higher prevalence than uh, we initially thought of about one in, uh, well, it's hard to say because he's only done 25, only done 25,000, but it's about one in, about one in 9,000. Um, so those will have to be followed up and make sure that they truly are. Um, but it has shown the feasibility of the approach and the fact that it can be done. So um, the plan is we're working with uh, groups in the U.S. to try to pilot it in, in the U.S. So you'd have to do a pilot in one state and show that it works and then spread it out across the country. So um, that's a really, I think it's a really important thing for our community to, uh, to, to be helping to advance. Um, and then there were some drug developments, uh, and I bet I'm getting close. Yeah, okay, so th there was some drug development. There's, a, there's an interesting new compound. Uh, some of you uh, may be familiar with a drug that was on the market in Europe uh, some years back, Ramonabant, um, that was very good at, at inducing weight loss. Unfortunately, there were psychiatric side effects and it got pulled from the market. It was actually tested in a very small group of individuals with PWS, but it was not well tolerated because of those psychiatric side effects. Well, now there's a next generation of that, and this generation of of CB1R blockers um, does not enter the brain. So it works in the periphery. It still has the same beneficial metabolic effects, um, but it does presumably will not have this, the psychiatric side effects. So FPWR has been supporting uh, a company that is uh, a startup that now has additional funding from venture capital because they were able to get those first initial studies to show that this drug stays in the periphery. It doesn't cross the blood-brain barrier. It has a much higher safety uh, window than the Ramon a band. Um, and so they are uh, really progressing very nicely now. And uh, the goal is to try a phase one study in healthy individuals uh, in sometime in 2020 and then try in PWS after that. So that's an exciting, uh, Susan mentioned, you know, we have clinical trials now, we have things coming down the line. So there's, there's additional uh, drugs that may be beneficial in PWS. Um, and there were some, uh, some of you may be uh, familiar with the Case Western group and have done the, the pretend play. We know that kids with, even young kids with PWS, they don't play exactly the way um, maybe, well, it's hard to say they should play a particular way, but they're, they have a hard time with imagination and playing. And, and that may be a, a, a something that you can intervene and it may help with their entire social development. And so the group at Case Western Anastasia Dimitropoulos' group has been piloting this telehealth medicine to improve play in kids. They started presenting the results of those studies showing that the kids can with an intervention, uh, you know, uh, play in line with that's more typical of a typically developing kids so you can make those improvements um, and they're working on seeing how that translates into a general development uh, overall and they're still recruiting so there's flyers on the back for school age kids so if you have a school age child it it, it really helps and so you'll probably want to get in on that study um, and then uh, Caroline from our uh, uh, research team 
presented a study that many of you may have participated in, uh, which was uh, for those of you who have kids over the age of 12, perhaps you enrolled in the weight-based study that was all text-based. So we had an online study that you could enroll in, and every week you got a text and asked how much your child weighed. And it was a way of uh, us gathering information on a large group of individuals with PWS about how weight changes over time. And this is really important because now we have drugs that we're going to hopefully will get approved and get out on the market. We have a baseline to say, are these drugs actually working in the real world? Uh, it also gives us an idea of what is the range of weight and how weight normally changes over time. So if we're comparing it to some of the new therapies, we have some basis to compare. So thank you for everyone who participated in that. Um, we uh, got some really nice data about uh, generally weight being pretty stable over time, but there being a, a great deal of variability. This study also showed that those individuals who had a longer amount of time on growth hormone had lower weights and lower BMIs, again, strengthening the argument that longer times on growth hormone is, is probably a beneficial thing to our kids. Natalie and I talked to the group about some of the tools that FPWR is, is developing to help them with their work, advance their work. So uh, I won't go through all of them now, except to point out the Global PWS Registry, which Jessica is going to talk about. Um, it really hits on every aspect of, of the research. And uh, you know, having every member of our community be in the Global Registry and contributing data to that is a, r a really important way that every person can be helping us understand all of the aspects of PWS. Um, and there were some several studies that were presented using data from the global registry at the meeting, understanding uh, behavioral profiles, understanding what drugs uh, kids are taking, and adults, and uh, the preliminary results of the Path for PWS study. Uh, there was some uh, discussion about clinical trials that are planned or ongoing. I'm not going to really mention these uh, except to say that uh, you'll hear more about these tomorrow morning, but some of the scientific side uh, was presented at the meeting, which was great for getting input from others. And that's it. So that was a day and a half in 20, 30 minutes. So uh, open to questions. No questions. That, <laughs> should I put everybody to sleep or what? Yeah. Please use the mics so we can hear you. Sure. Uh, you. One of the studies you brought up, or one of the people now working with us, has a history with CRISPR, and you said that she had done a previous project um, on a different something unrelated to PWS. I was just wondering what the how effective that project was and how like. What is the promise we see in CRISPR when it comes to PWS? Right, so that's a, so they're using CRISPR to turn genes on, and that project was actually pretty successful. So there's this single gene that the trick is it was a single gene, right? You know, we have a very complicated genetics, but it was a single gene, SIM1, which is important in uh, developing. And I'm go going, stepping outside my box. So it's important in developing uh, oxytocin neurons in the brain. And so, um, and, and those mice, because their oxytocin neurons are not quite right, they, they, they become obese. And so what she showed is by using a CRISPR way to turn the genes back on, so there's a deficiency of the genes, and she can go in and turn them back on, and then the mice uh, do not become obese. So it was very successful in that model, and the basic technology is likely something that would, could be applied to PWS. Now, it was only in mice, and using CRISPR in humans, especially in human brains, I think is a long way off. But to show that you can use that general approach and see what the effect is and see whether it has a beneficial effect in PWS would be uh, of interest. I know it's a broad question, but could you, um, what, do you what is long way off in scientific terms? <laughs> So I, so I come up, so I think CRISPR itself into the brain is a long way off because CRISPR is actually, it's a, so now I'm going to get in the weeds. 
is a bacterial protein, right? And so it's a foreign protein. And so when you express a foreign protein in the brain, it evokes an immune response. So before I'm going to put a CRISPR into my child, I want to make sure that that's not going to you know, cause the brain to become inflamed, right? So, so those kinds of big picture questions have to be addressed before we would be ready to do that. Uh, as well as like, how do you get it into the right part of the brain? How do you make sure it's expressed at the right level? So there's a lot of sort of gene therapy questions that have to be addressed that others in the field are also addressing for other disorders. So it's ongoing, but I think it's, it's way too hard to predict. Um, but there may be other ways to do the same thing that maybe you are more amenable to going into the clinic, and those may come faster. So that's a non-answer, I know. <laughs> but I don't, I don't, it's at least five years, but okay, probably longer. Hi, Teresa, how you doing? Doing good. Okay. Um, one thing that's come up, uh, several times over, I guess, the last few years for us is that as the clinical trials come up, you know, we've worked so hard to keep Kieran thin, right, and to really monitor his food intake and exercise and everything else. So he doesn't qualify for a lot of the clinical trials. And then as far as some of them, <clears throat> they want him to be in hyperphagia. And he's really, what Jen says is like phase 2B, I guess. So it's right before, he's, he's obsessed with food, but he's not seeking it, um, he's not foraging for food. So I'm wondering how we're doing as a community as far as filling those clinical trials, because a lot of them, uh, you know, we haven't been able to participate in. Yeah, I think that's a challenge for the community. Between all of the clinical trials that are ongoing, it's more than 500 patients are needed to fill them. That's a lot for, for, for our community. So that is a challenge. And, you know, there's, I mean, that's one of the things that the consortium is addressing. So there's two schools of thought. One is that it's good to keep the inclusion criteria kind of tight because then you're, 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 you're bringing in the kids or adults that have the, highest degree of hyperphagia and you have something to kind of to work against to show the efficacy, if you can show that and get approval, then it would just be approved for everyone who has hyperphagia and you wouldn't have to like probably do the scale ahead of time. So one school of thought is let's keep it at the, the sort of the hardest kids so that we can show the effects, so that we can get the approval, so that we can get it out in the community. But there's also, you know, can we measure that stage, that earlier stage, where the kids are clearly obsessed with food, there's clearly something going on, and um, treat them at that point so that they don't progress to hyperphagia. So I think it's a little, the, the studies that are going on now are really focused on, you know, getting that highest group uh, but I think moving forward, there may be some thought to trying to include, uh, you know, kids that are in that 2B. So, both. Yeah. But we are filling the studies. Like, it's not that they're sitting waiting because... They, they, you know, they're filling. I think it's always beneficial to fill faster. I think if you asked any of the companies, they would want to fill faster than they're filling. Uh, uh, but... Um, you know, there's other complications too, getting the sites up and going and getting enough, you know, a, a sort of locations. Sorry. <laughs> um, so they're, they always want them to fill faster and, and we all want them to fill faster um, so that we can get them done and, and, and see the answer. So yeah, we still need. Can that's another vote for the registry. More people in the registry is, is us being able to contact the right people and encourage them to learn more about specific clinical trials. Can I, can I yeah, just please. add something? Uh, yeah, to, you know, with regards to your question, uh, I, th I think it's also important. You know, the, one of the difficulties, that's something that we are interested in the consortium, is also trying you know, to develop outcome measures and to you know, enroll uh, patients who are even at the pre-hyperphagic stage. But one of the challenges, you know, one is to, is to really uh, have really good measures that would tell us, and then to how do we, do we assess treatment benefits. So, for example, you might have heard, and we invited her to our consortium, uh, about uh, Dr. Alexandra Keys at Vanderbilt University, who is using eye tracking and other direct measure. So this doesn't rely on you filling a questionnaire, but it's really measuring the movement of the eyes and looking through that kind of measure, 
you know, into the interest in food. And she's also developing other type of measures. It's called event-related event potential. It's basically the activity, the brain activities, and see if we can detect what is called a biomarker, you know, that can tell you that doesn't really rely on, on the parents or on the patients, you know, but really measures directly the activities, you know. And we have a number of other projects lo looking at brain activities for that. So hopefully, you know, in the meantime, you know, hopefully, you know, industry can, can find therapeutics that are, you know, at least for, for patients who are older. And then in the meantime, we are trying also to develop some, you know, objective biomarkers that could be used for future clinical trial enrolling patients before they develop hyperphagia. Other questions, or? I probably don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, how do you advise that, actually, it would be good. So yeah. What would you uh, suggest for parents that can't decide on what trial to do, or who should we talk to? How do you make that decision on what might be most beneficial to your child and to the community? Right, so I think the, the key, you know, so, I always say it, like I would never push anyone to go to a particular clinical trial, but what we can push you to do is to, if your child is eligible for a clinical trial, to make that effort to learn about it. I think uh, we'll talk tomorrow, and we have resources on the website about, you know, questions to ask and who to ask. And, you know, the, I, I think the, the doctor at the site is probably, and their study team is probably the best to, to ask questions about what does the trial entail and what are the safety risks and what is the possible benefit. Um, so making that effort to learn about a clinical trial or learn about all the clinical trials that you're eligible for so you can compare and decide which one, you know, there's the practical side of it, like which one can I manage to get to? And then there's the other side of it of, you know, what, what drugs make the most sense for my child. I mean, there are some, some of these, uh, the drugs that are currently in clinical trials, some of them are for hyperphagia, some of them for hyperphagia with anxiety, some of them have uh, the potential to maybe uh, modulate aggressive behavior. So it really, it really depends on what are you and your, you know, your loved one with PWS kind of struggling with the most. What makes the most sense, you know, as far as traveling to a clinical trial, and what do you feel most comfortable with as far as your tolerance for risk? So all of those things. But it, so it'll be a long process, but but just making the effort to learn about that is really important. 